Uh, welcome everybody. It was a beautiful day here, uh, you know, in uh, in New Jersey. So I know that uh, uh, that people really made an, an effort to come to this wonderful lecture by a very very distinguished guest that we have uh, uh, that we have uh, as our as our uh, lecture today. Before we start, I would like to invite our vice president for mission and ministry, Father Colin who is really a friend of Catholic studies, a very dear colleague, and of course, you know, su supports with all his hearts and all his soul, the mission of this great university, Seton Hall University, that, that we are all part of. Father Colin, please. Thank you, Ines. A pleasure to be with you, Dr. Ravielli. Thank you for being with us. Um, I suspect we can all agree um, we are prepared for the big stuff. Forgive me for using the technical term. We are prepared for the big stuff by the little stuff, the seemingly little moments, the little encounters, the little choices, including the, the choice to pray. Thank you for making with me the choice to pray this evening, to pray a little bit like Gianna. As we take a moment, we remember all who are in need tonight, especially mothers and fathers expecting the birth of a child, husbands and wives struggling with infertility, those wrestling with loss and grief and maybe fear over a daunting pregnancy. We remember all who are most weak, most vulnerable, all the poor. And we entrust them as no doubt Gianna did tonight to the mother of Jesus. I will pray for you. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women and blessed is the fruit of your womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. May the Lord bless us, protect us from all evil, and guide us safely to everlasting life. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you for that very, very beautiful uh, prayer, Father Colin. And in this special day, because it is the feast day of San Gianna Beretta Molla today. So uh, <laughs> really this, uh, this lecture is made in heaven, people, you know, celebrating uh, Gianna Molla in her feast day. And it was the, uh, this all was the, the idea of my dear colleague here, who has joined the department and the program in Catholic studies, uh, Dr. Travelin. For those of you who do not know me, I am Dr. Murzaku. I am a professor uh, of religion and also the chair and the program director of Catholic studies here at Seton Hall University. Now, a Catholic studies actually teaches, um, this, this is a, uh, the student, uh, a part of the students that are here are Dr. Traveling's, uh, uh, students who are taking Dr. Traveling's course. Uh, I'm sure that a good part of them are pre-meds or people who aspire to join the medical, uh, the, the healthcare field. Now, uh, we have a number of courses actually in Catholic studies that connect the Catholic intellectual tradition to, in this case, to, to healthcare, right? To healthcare. So, and that is the particularity of our program. Core one and core two, they lay the foundations of the Catholic intellectual tradition. And core three takes this tradition 
to the disciplines. And that is what makes students that teach, that, that, that study at Seton Hall University different from students who, who study healthcare in other, other universities. It is this Catholic intellectual tradition. This is our niche that we offer via our courses. And um, this, this wonderful, very, very popular course is Catholicism, Healthcare and the Human Condition that is taught by two medical doctors. Dr. Anthony Carlino teaches for, uh, in the fall and then Dr. Uh, John Fraveline teaches it in the spring now. So, and to my knowledge, we are the only Catholic university to offer this course taught by two medical doctors. So that being said, I would like to uh, introduce my dear colleague uh, and friend uh, who has joined the department and the program in Catholic studies this semester teaching Catholicism, healthcare and human condition, uh, Dr. Travelin. Uh, Dr. Trevelyan is professor of theoretic medicine and surgery at Lewis Katz School of Medicine at Temple University. He earned his medical degree from Jefferson Medical College, completed training in internal medicine at the University of Maryland Medical Center, and then pulmonary and critical care medicine at Temple University Hospital. His interest in religion and medicine is long-standing and weaving Christian ethics as a discipline complementing his practice of medicine began as a graduate student of religious studies at Villanova University. He has been uh, particularly interested in understanding human suffering in the context of illness and engaging medical students and physicians in conversation about caring for patients in accord with their dignity as persons, especially at the end of life. Dr. Trevelyan, now you have the floor. Yes, thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Thanks for being here. A special thank you to my students for joining, joining us this evening. Thank you all. Uh, students especially, and everyone here uh, for this um, for this this inaugural lecture uh, on this this blessed feast day. Um, it's truly a pleasure of mine to introduce this evening's speaker. Um, Dr. Kathy Ravielli is a board certified, recently retired gynecologist in the Atlanta, Georgia area. She's a fellow in the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists and a member of the American Association of Pro-Life OBGYNs. She was on the board of the Catholic Medical Association in various roles for over 10 years, serving as president of the Catholic Medical Association in the year 2008. She represents the CMA as a consultant for the Pro-Life Secretariat of the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops. She completed the National Catholic Bioethics Center's course on healthcare ethics in 2010 and speaks throughout the Archdiocese of Atlanta on marriage and human life topics. She served as the volunteer medical director for the Pregnancy Aid Clinic for 10 years and on the board of Post-Abortion Treatment Healing, which assists women and men in recovery from an abortion. She currently serves on the board of the Georgia Life Alliance, which advocates for women in crisis pregnancies and human trafficking. I've known Kathy for many years through our mutual involvement in the Catholic Medical Association at the national level. And in addition to her dedication and work in these life endeavors, I can attest to the exuberance she displays always in her faithful witness and love for our Lord 
and others she serves. Please welcome Dr. Kathy Raffaelli. Thank you so much, John, for that beautiful introduction. Now, Inez, how can I share my screen? Just hit share screen. Yes. Okay, perfect. Well, I'll tell you, ladies and gentlemen, it's really an honor to talk about one of my favorite saints uh, tonight, Saint Gianna Beretta Mola, and how she, her uh, witness helped me in the doctor-patient relationship, but just how she is such a role model for all doctors, but especially Catholic doctors. Saint Gianna uh, Mola was made co-patroness of the Catholic Medical Association in 2010 with Saint Luke. And she personified the importance of preparation for entering the field of medicine as a Catholic. Her childhood experiences formed her as a warm and welcoming person, allowing her to relate to patients and meet them where they were. She entered into her patients' lives and was able to influence them to make the right choices for their health care through her encouragement and her example. She had many qualities which, she, which we can emulate as laypersons, and if in healthcare, in our dealings with patients. Most importantly, Saint Gianna lived her faith in her vocation as a physician, and she practiced in her own life what she preached. Saint Gianna was born in 1922 to devout Catholic parents near Milan, Italy and was one of the youngest of 13 children. That sounds extraordinary today. Her parents decided on their wedding day to welcome all the children God would give them. Her father moved the family several times to avoid the Spanish flu, which was 1918 to 1920 or so. But despite this, three of their children died in the pandemic before St. Gianna was born. The family also moved for safety when World War II began. Her parents lost two more children as infants and then another older daughter to tuberculosis at the age of 26. Then both her parents died within a short period of time when Gianna was 20 years old. However, the family bond among the remaining siblings was very strong. Two of her brothers became priests and a younger sister entered religious life. Drawn to helping others, three of her siblings became physicians and one became a pharmacist. Catholics are naturally drawn to medicine, but so much illness and death in her family probably inspired St. Gianna and her siblings to become physicians. Gianna went to daily mass her whole life. And in her second year of high school, a Jesuit priest gave a retreat for the students at her school, which had a profound effect on Gianna. The retreat helped her to develop a quote, program of life, which can be summarized in a prayer that she composed. Quote, Jesus, I promise to submit to everything that you will allow to happen to me. Only help me to know your will, end of quote. Although she had struggled in the past in her studies, she now dedicated herself to school and became an exceptional student. As a young woman, she was very active in a lay movement called Catholic Action, working with girls and young women as an apostle. She also enjoyed working with the poor and the elderly in the St. Vincent de Paul Society. She wrote, quote, our task is to make the truth visible and lovable in ourselves, offering ourselves as an attractive and if possible, heroic example." End of quote. Gianna was also careful about her personal appearance 
and dressed very tastefully. As physicians in an increasingly casual culture, we should always dress professionally as our appearance lends credibility to the advice that we give our patients. She was well-rounded, loving music, art, and the beauty of nature, especially the mountains, where she and her husband spent a couple of months each summer on vacation with their children. In spite of World War II, she graduated from college and medical school, setting up her medical practice caring for women and children with her physician brother, Ferdinando. She married Pietro Molo, you can see here, an engineer who was 10 years older than herself in 1955 after a beautiful, pure courtship with touching correspondence between the two of them. And it was interesting, uh, St. Gianna actually took care of Pietro's sister when she was very sick and she actually ultimately died. And that's how she met Pietro. Her husband said of her, quote, my wife had infinite faith in God, but I never realized I was living with a saint. Gianna was a woman who was full of the joy of living. She loved her family, her profession as a physician. She loved her home, music, mountains, flowers, all the beautiful gifts that God has given. She seemed to me to be a completely ordinary woman, but as Archbishop Colombo has said, who actually promoted her canonization, quote, holiness does not consist of extraordinary signs. Above all, it consists of the daily acceptance of the unfathomable designs of God, end of quote. All the pictures of St. Gianna show her with a beautiful smile. And in her letter to Pietro right before their wedding, she wrote about the value of a smile. Quote, she said, to smile at God, from whom all gifts come to us, to smile to God, the Father, with ever more perfect prayers to the Holy Spirit, to smile at Jesus, drawing near him in holy mass, in communion, in visits to the blessed sacrament, to smile at him who personifies Christ, the Pope, at him who personifies God, our confessor, even when he calls us to mortification, to smile at the Holy Virgin, model upon which we must pattern our lives so that whoever looks at us may be led to good thoughts, to smile at the guardian angel because he was given us by God to guide us to paradise, to smile at parents, brothers, and sisters because we ought to be torches of joy even when they impose duties on us that go against our pride, to smile always, pardoning offenses, to smile in the association, she met Catholic action, banishing any criticism and murmuring, to smile at those whom the Lord sends us during the day. The world seeks joy, but does not find it because it is far from God. We, full of joy that comes from Jesus, carry joy in our hearts with Jesus. He will be the strength that helps us, end of quote. As Catholic Christians, we're called to be joyful. And in our encounters with patients, we should remember the disarming effect of a smile. This morning, I talked about St. Gianna to two classes of three-year-olds. <laughs> this is quite a difference in one day. Uh, and it was very interesting because as they came out on the lawn to hear about St. Gianna on her feast day, they all came out with very grumpy looks on their face. And I focused on the value of a smile with them. Letter writing is a lost art in the 21st century where for better or for worse, ideas are expressed in short sound bites without the opportunity to develop the thought. I would strongly recommend reading St. Gianna's letters to her husband in the collection called Gianna, the Love Letters of a Saint to see how to speak to your spouse, whether in speech or in writing. These letters are a good example for all of us in remembering that part of our job in marriage is to get our spouse to heaven. After their marriage, Pietro would accompany her on house calls at night. She cared for each individual patient with a professional attitude and had a special tenderness for mothers and the elderly, often giving them money for medicine. 
She always went the extra mile to get patients what they needed. She treated her pediatric patients as though they were her own children. And here she is holding two of her children, Pierre Luigi and Mary Lena, while she's pregnant with Laura. She knew how to deal with difficult situations without being judgmental. When women came to see her upset about a pregnancy and seeking an abortion, she guided them toward embracing the will of God and accepting the pregnancy. But she also told them, quote, it, namely abortion, is a sin against God. Life is sacred, end of quote. If the woman did go ahead and have an abortion, she still cared for her, but urged her to consider the gravity of what she had done. The test of her faith came when she was expecting her fourth child. She developed a benign, non-cancerous tumor on her uterus called a fibroid or a leiomyomata, which was causing her a great deal of pain. So she underwent an abdominal surgery with removal of the fibroid by an OBGYN who was assisted by her brother, Ferdinando. Before the surgery, she instructed the surgeon to do all to protect the baby over her own life. Fortunately, after the successful surgery, the pregnancy continued to term where she underwent a failed induction of labor. They tried to induce her labor, but it did not work. And this was followed by a cesarean section. Again, she instructed the surgeon to preserve the baby's life over her own. A healthy baby girl was born, but over the next few days, Gianna developed peritonitis and despite antibiotics, died a week after the birth. She lived out what she had advised so many of her patients. Pietro wrote about his wife. You made your sacrifice for the sake of charity because of your sense of maternal responsibility, because of the supreme respect you had for that pregnancy, for the child in your womb, who in your view had the same inviolable rights as the other babies you had carried and given birth to, as well as those you might have had in the future. All of them were gifts from God." End of quote. St. Gianna Mola lived a life of virtue that led her to the moment when she chose to lay down her life for her unborn child. She loved life and had achieved balance in her life as a wife, a mother, and a physician. May we all strive to imitate her example in our relationship with God, in our families, in our places of work. And these are some scenes from her canonization uh, St. John Paul II canonized her on May 16th, 2004. Uh, in the upper right-hand corner, you see him talking to Gianna Emanuelina, the daughter that whose life she saved, and her husband, Pietro. And uh, in the lower left corner, they're greeting St. John Paul II. St. Gianna was the last person to be canonized by Pope St. John Paul II. And then you see some other pictures of her with Pietro and holding uh, one of her children. I think that was Laura. So now I'd like to share from my experience as a Catholic physician and how the examples St. Gianna gave as a Catholic physician can be implemented really into any of our lives. For 27 years, I practiced as a Catholic physician, which doesn't mean that you tell people all the time, this is what the Catholic church teaches and you must do it or I won't take care of you or anything like that. It means that you're applying Catholic moral teaching to how you treat patients. The first 17 years of my career, I practiced secular medicine. And despite absolutely loving the field of obstetrics and gynecology, I was not satisfied in my work. And more importantly, I saw patients were not happy or healthy with the way women's health issues were treated. In 1991, I underwent a reversion to my faith of my childhood and began praying every day. I prayed the rosary every day with my family. I started going to confession regularly, once a month. I started reading sacred scripture every day with my children. And I started going to mass on days other than Sunday, like on my day off or on Saturday if I weren't on call. 
and I started making sacrifices. I went on a religious pilgrimage to Europe and spoke with a priest over there about my medical practice. He told me the Catholic Church had taught about the sanctity of marriage, the proper spacing of children, and the sacredness of all human life from conception to natural death since the time of Jesus Christ. He told me I needed to leave my medical practice and go into practice by myself, and I would have more time for my husband and my children. A month later, I left my four partners, who were my four best friends, and began my own gynecology practice. I no longer provided contraception or sterilizations to patients, which actually represents about a third of a gynecologist's practice. I had to give up my beloved obstetrics in which I had additional fellowship training because I couldn't be involved in sterilizations often done at the time of cesarean sections. It was a leap of faith, but I understood I'd been searching for the truth and this was it. I had to change my life. However, even though I now took on faith what the Catholic church taught about marriage and family life, I had to be more educated in that area. We're fortunate today to have the Catechism of the Catholic Church, but it wasn't published until 1994, three years after my conversion. I did have some church documents which I had never read before, such as Humanae Vitae and Donum Vitae on the proper means of spacing children and doing uh, helping couples with infertility. And most importantly, I had the writings of Pope St. John Paul II that comprised his theology of the body. Father Paul Marx, who directed Human Life International at that time, was a tremendous support for me. And in 1996, I discovered the Catholic Medical Association. The Catholic Medical Association was founded in 1932, and its purpose is to provide fellowship for Catholic physicians, help them grow in their spiritual lives, and educate them in the ethical practice of medicine. I had joined a family of physicians and other healthcare workers, and now also medical students who were living out their Catholic faith in the science and practice of medicine. Interestingly, I also encountered many other Catholic OBGYNs and family practice doctors who also had been led to make major changes in their medical practices. So first look at the value of prayer as a physician. Doctors can think, and I thought for many years, that their good outcomes, patients' good outcomes came from their skill alone. But they forget that God uses doctors to heal people. Before I was aware of this, I was at the scrub sink one day with one of my partners, the physician partner who had brought me into my group, and she happened to mention that she prayed every time before operating on people. That had not occurred to me before. So I started praying for my patients before doing any procedures on them. One Saturday afternoon, I received a call from a patient in early labor with her first baby. I sent her to the hospital and shortly thereafter, the nurses on labor and delivery called and said she had ruptured her membranes and the fluid was stained with meconium. In other words, the baby had had a bowel movement in utero, which is a sign of fetal distress. The fetal heart monitor was also showing the baby in distress and she was remote from delivery. I told them to call anesthesia and get her ready for an emergency cesarean section. I arrived at the hospital a few minutes later, confirmed the nurse's evaluation and explain the situation to the patient and her husband. We went back to the operating room and because she was going to be put to sleep, her husband had to go to the waiting room where there were several members of the family anxiously awaiting the birth of this baby. The very experienced anesthesiologist who was putting this patient to sleep with me ready to begin the section as soon as she was intubated, ran into a major problem. He could not get an endotracheal tube down her airway. And this is a huge problem in a pregnant patient because giving general anesthesia, if you don't have a good airway, the patient could vomit and then breathe in stomach contents. 
Finally, he told me to just go ahead with the surgery that he would bag her. Very dangerous situation. The alarms were going off as he was trying to keep her well ventilated and the baby came out with poor APGAR scores. The baby was had low oxygen and had to be resuscitated. The surgery was completed in 20 minutes and by then they had found an ear, nose and throat doctor to do a tracheostomy on my patient. She went to the ICU on a ventilator and the baby went to the neonatal intensive care unit. I went out to the waiting room and explained what had happened to her husband and the family. I told the family that they needed to get down on their knees and pray for her and the baby as they could both die or be significantly brain damaged from a prolonged lack of oxygen. I sat with the patient in the ICU and at three o'clock in the morning, she opened her eyes and motioned she wanted to say something of course she had a tube in, she couldn't talk. I handed her paper and pencil and she wrote, what happened? She was all right. I followed her for several years and her son turned out to be an A student with no lasting sequelae from that difficult delivery. Prayer works. Prayer can also move mountains and is a witness to others. On my third medical mission with Helping Hands Medical Missions to a town in Southwestern Mexico many years ago, my team met in Houston one Saturday afternoon and then flew on to Guadalajara with all our medications and surgical instruments borrowed from our hospitals in our luggage. Our leader, a Latino nurse from Dallas was not with us, but one of our team was a Spanish speaking family practice physician from Miami. When we started to go through customs, he went to the head of customs with a permit for our trip and found out it was for the state that we were going to, that we, it was the state that we were in, Guadalajara, not the state we were traveling to. He was told we could either get back on a plane to the US or leave all our supplies at the airport and come back on Monday to work it out. The town we were going to was a four hour bus drive from the airport and it was very likely that the instruments and medications would not be there when we came back. The physician had tried everything, including bribery to get us through. Neither option they had given us was good. So we sent the physician back to talk to the customs agent some more. Then all 17 of us knelt down in the airport and prayed the rosary out loud that his heart would be softened. When we were done, we stood up. And shortly after that, the physician who was negotiating for us came back and said, grab your things, he's going to let us through. On the bus, he told us he didn't know what we were doing as, we had our, as he had our, his back to us, but the official could see us. And he was as he was talking to him, he saw a tear slowly traveling down the agent's cheek. And then suddenly he gave his approval. The Miami physician said it was a total turnaround as he had tried everything to convince the man. It was a miracle. That night at mass, the gospel reading included this passage from Matthew's gospel, quote, amen, I say to you, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. As a Catholic physician, you're also aware of the power of the sacraments. An elderly patient of mine came in for her annual visit one day and told me she had experienced a miracle. She woke up on New Year's morning with a heavy feeling in her chest. Her husband took her to the emergency room and the physician discerned right away she was in major distress. Her cardiologist was on staff at that hospital, but repeated calls could not locate him. The staff paged for any cardiologist to come to the emergency room stat. In the meantime, her son called their pastor. He came to the emergency room and gave her the anointing of the sick. A cardiologist then arrived and by echocardiogram discovered that she had a large blood clot in the right ventricle, which signified impending death. However, he said, although it probably wouldn't work, 
he was going to try an intravenous drug that breaks up small clots. As he gave the drug, they watched her under the echocardiogram and the clot disappeared. The physician, who was not Christian, said, that was a miracle. That drug, the drug doesn't work for such large clots. The family knew it was the sacrament of the anointing of the sick that had saved her. The patient said she had told her story to others and they didn't believe it was a miracle, but she knew it was and her doctor knew it was. We have to be open to the way God works in our lives. I had a lovely elderly Chinese patient from Taiwan whom I saw frequently for many years. She had come over to visit her daughter and then just stayed. She spoke no English, but she always came in with a big smile and wearing her best clothes. Her daughter said she loved to come into our office and she loved my staff and we all loved her. She had no health insurance and had a problem called pelvic relaxation, which I managed with a pessary like a donut to hold everything up so she to avoid costly surgery. As an aside, I saw many women over the years with no health insurance, so I charged them a reduced level of care and negotiated lab rates so they would pay less for their care. One day when she came in, we found her to be anemic with weight loss. I sent her to an internist who discovered she had esophageal cancer. She was treated with radiation and had a feeding tube placed in her stomach. She lived another two years. But one day her daughter called and asked if she could bring her in because she was quite sick, but they couldn't get an answer from her internist about how much longer she had to live. The daughter and her husband and another daughter who was visiting from Taiwan literally carried her into my office. She was unconscious. I told them I would expect her to die within the week, but they should keep providing her food and water through her feeding tube unless it seemed to make her sick. And most importantly, they needed to keep talking to her. The patient was non-Christian and recalling a story about Mother Teresa who cares for many, her, her order cares for many non-Christians respectfully as they're dying. I asked the daughters if they would like me to give their mother the ticket to give to St. Peter. They immediately said yes. And I told them I was going to baptize their mother. They agreed. I happened to have Lord's water, although I certainly could have used tap water, and I baptized her on the table in the examining room. She died four days later. Her daughters came back to see me a couple weeks later and said their mother had been saying for a month she wanted to go to heaven. I assured them she had. Several years later, her daughter also developed an advanced cancer and died. Her husband called me and said she was baptized before she died. The power of the sacraments. As Catholic physicians, we're called to be life affirming, but also we need to help carry other people's burdens. When I changed my medical practice, I stopped prescribing contraception and doing sterilizations. Contraception and sterilization are so ingrained in people's way of thinking because they've been front and center in women's health care since 1960. However, as a Catholic physician, we have to think outside of the box when it comes to family planning. So to help couples, I went through the training in several of the methods of natural family planning, including doing a medical consultant program to learn how to manage women's reproductive problems without using birth control pills. New patients, when they called my office for an appointment, were always informed that I did not prescribe the pill and the response with the, was either one of three things. That's why I'm coming, so I'll need to find another doctor. Or yes, I know, my friend refer, who referred me told me. Or three, yes, that's why I'm coming to her because I don't wanna be on the pill for X, Y, or Z. What I found was that treating women's abnormal bleeding, hormone imbalances, and painful periods was much more gratifying when the root of the problem was diagnosed and the proper treatment applied rather than using a birth control pill to cover up the problem. 
Teaching married and engaged couples natural family planning gave me and them an understanding about the woman's cycle that I had not appreciated in the 17 years I had been practicing OBGYN from a secular standpoint. Teaching NFP also helped me to, quote, meet patients where they're at, end of quote, and better understand their reasons for a visit to the doctor. It made me a better listener. About 15% of couples experience infertility and often are not thoroughly worked up before going into assisted reproductive technologies that are costly and do not respect the marital act or resultant offspring. There are many safe and simple treatments along with understanding the time of ovulation and focusing on those days to conceive that optimize the couple's chances of getting pregnant on their own that are frequently ignored. I did see many women who were using other methods of contraception, which I was not providing. One day, a woman came in to see me for her annual visit. She was in her early 30s, married for four years, and had no children. They were not trying to get pregnant and had no plans in the near future to start a family. I explained to her that a woman's fertility begins declining at 32 years of age, and that after 35, already 35% of women can no longer get pregnant. She told me they were waiting to pay off some loans and get, the, get their financial house in order. I told her there was never a perfect time to start a family, but she needed to understand her fertility. She went home and talked to her husband and they decided to start trying. Well, over the next eight years, she had four beautiful little boys and thanked me for the encouragement because they had no idea how much fun it was to be a parent. Over the years, her husband also kept getting better and better paying jobs, so she was able to be a stay-at-home mom. I taught one of the methods of natural family planning to hundreds of couples over 27 years, and it was so rewarding to see these couples grow in their faith and love for each other with many personal testimonies to that effect. Their mutual love and respect for each other was never more evident to me than in one of my couples who came to me for instruction. They had five children. And one Sunday morning, the husband, who was a captain in, the fight in his firefighter squad, was riding all-terrain vehicles with his two older sons and had an accident with severe head trauma. He was taken by helicopter to a nearby trauma center and his wife met them there. He was in a coma. The doctors were not optimistic that he would have any kind of recovery and told her he would probably be in a quote, vegetative state, end of quote, the rest of his life. She told them that didn't matter, that she loved him and they were to give him the best care possible. She only hoped he would get his sense of humor back. In three weeks or so, he came out of his coma, but he was unable to walk. She moved mountains, literally mountains, to get him into a spinal rehab center. But when they arrived, the doctors told her that after reviewing his records, they were not optimistic that he would ever walk again. She told them to do their best, that she loved him and would take care of him no matter what. And all she wanted was his sense of humor back. Well, several weeks later, he walked out of the spinal center on a walker. Two years later, I ran into them at a conference and he was his normal self and had returned to work as a firefighter. And he had his sense of humor back. Their parish was a tremendous support with both prayer and meals through their whole ordeal. Lastly, St. Gianna recalled the, importance of a spirit, uh, recalled the importance of a spiritual retreat she was on in high school and how it helped her focus on what was important, growth in her spiritual life, concentrating on schoolwork so she'd become a physician. Annual spiritual retreats are very important because we live in a very fast paced, always changing society with information overload. It's important to get away periodically and spend some time with our Lord 
I go on retreat every year and we leave our electronics behind. I was on a retreat several years ago with about 40 women and we had been silent for 48 hours. Can you imagine 40 women not talking for 48 hours? We were gathered in the chapel for morning prayer on Sunday morning and the priest leading the retreat came to the back of the room and started invoking the Holy Spirit. He asked the Holy Spirit to enlighten each of us as to why we were there. I immediately understood that God was sending women to me in my medical practice and that I should not be afraid to help them get on the right path. I'll give you two examples. A new patient came to see me for her regular yearly exam and I saw from her history she had no children but had had an abortion 17 years earlier. After talking with her and completing the exam, she got dressed and came back to my office to discuss the visit. After our discussion, I said, I noticed she'd had an abortion many years earlier and how did she feel about it now? She immediately started crying and said she thought about it every day. She said a coworker who also had had an abortion would meet her at the water cooler every day and they would talk about what their children might've been what they might've looked like, what activities they would have been in at this point in their lives. I talked to her about the mercy of God and that her child had forgiven her and that I thought she and her friend would benefit from a post-abortion support group. She told me she had never shared this with another physician. And after giving her the uh, information for this confidential support group, I gave her a big hug. One Tuesday afternoon, I received a call for the abortion pill reversal hotline regarding an 18 year old girl who had taken RU46 mifepristone that morning and had changed her mind. Could I help her? I called the girl and we discussed it and I placed her on high dose progesterone, which is necessary to support a pregnancy to counteract the effects of the mifepristone. I saw her two days later in the office with her boyfriend and her mother who spoke no English. She had traveled about 50 miles to an abortion clinic near me and had second thoughts right after taking the pills. When she returned home, she told her mother what she had done and her mother urged her to see if the abortion could be stopped. We succeeded in stopping the abortion. I asked the girl at the visit if she had any religious background and she said, yes, she was Catholic. I asked her which parish she was in and when she told me, I said, I knew her pastor very well, and he was very understanding. I recommended she call him and go visit him that day with her boyfriend so they could be reconciled with God. It was Holy Thursday. The clinic she had gone to for the abortion was one that my parish prays outside of every Tuesday. Lastly, I walked into a difficult situation one morning with the last patient of the morning. I was ready for a lunch break, but God had another plan. When I walked into the room, the patient told me she was when I walked into the room, the patient told me that she was there to make sure she was healthy because the plan was for her to have an artificial insemination the next week so she and her partner could have a child. While she got dressed after the exam and left the room and had, I had a little conversation with God. Lord, why did you send me this lady? I don't wanna to talk to her about this now, I'm hungry. I wanna to go to lunch. But I said a prayer to the Holy Spirit. I knew that she had been sent for a reason. And I went back in my office and we sat down and talked. After telling her she was fine, I explained to her that this action was not going to make her happy that God intended that every child should come about through the love between a husband and a wife in the marital act, that every child has the right to know his or her mother and father and to be raised by them. I told her studies have shown that fathers are the most important parent and the child would never know their father. After our conversation, she got up and thanked me and left. I figured I would never see her again. A year later, I walked into the exam room and there she was. She asked me if I remembered our conversation the year before, which I did, but of course I had not noted it in the chart. She told me she had gone home and sat in her living room and what we had talked about kept running through her head. She decided she would not do the insemination 
And when her partner came home from work, my patient told her she would buy her out of her share of the house and she wanted her to leave. I hadn't talked to her about this relationship. She also said she went and was baptized. I hadn't talked to her about baptism or Jesus Christ. And she said she had called her mother and told her she forgave her for all the abuse she had done to her as a small child. I was truly astounded that our talk had yielded all this change of heart. She came back to see me every year for many years and thanked me for telling her the truth. But I said I had to thank her for showing her I needed, I, showing me I needed not to be afraid to have these difficult discussions. So in summary, the life of St. Gianna Mola is a perfect example of how one should balance career and family, keeping God at the center of both. Her final decision to sacrifice her life so that her baby daughter was live, would live was based on a solid foundation of heroic deeds she had done throughout her life. She's a modern day role model for all physicians, but especially women physicians. And there have been so many different medical practices and clinics named after St. Gianna. This is one St. Gianna Clinic, which is in Wisconsin. And again, you see uh, Gianna uh, Emanuelina, her daughter, the, whose life she saved. She also became a physician, um, a gerontologist. She took care of the elderly. And uh, her father died uh, at the age of 97. And uh, Gianna, Dr. Gianna, took care of her, took care of him up until the time of his death. So. And I'll close there. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Raviella. Uh, now we will open, uh, Dr. Traveline, do you wanna take over now? John? Yes, just a moment. Hi, that was wonderful, Kathy. Thank you so much. You're welcome. I see a lot of people actually have written uh, here in the chat. So continue to use the chat. Uh, John? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Kathy, thank you so much. I was particularly um, drawn mm -hmm. to, as I, as I usually am with, uh, with witness stories, how, how powerful um, they are with, with patients and, um, and how, as you uh, testified to how uh, effective um, and how much they yield, their, their efficacy in, in yielding, bringing people to, uh, to see what's truly good and, and beautiful. Yeah, I think that uh, patients um, come to us with great expectations um, and it's so important to not only be speaking from a, a base of knowledge that you're well-formed from an educational standpoint, but also speaking to them from a heartfelt standpoint. Um, you know, um, we used to have a very paternalistic uh, medical field, but there's still certainly room for us to be mothers, fathers, brothers, sisters to mm -hmm. the patients that we see. I, I often um, think, and I've been trying to emphasize with students uh, both here, but, um, but also with the med students to the extent that I can, and uh, you know, in, a, in appropriate non, you know, certainly, um, mm -hmm. Uh, well, you know, just reducing, reducing what we do in medicine, in all the health professions, um, caring for one another, just, just that's fundamentally what it is. And, uh, you know, I often say words matter. And I try to emphasize that, you know, that care is caritas in, in Latin, love. And, um, and that, you know, in, um, I mean, that's, that's really at the root of what we do all of us mm -hmm. in whatever profession uh, that we, we have, but, but particularly in the, in the healthcare profession where we see people that are so vulnerable and um, so much in need and we can bring to bear our um, knowledge or expertise in given uh, areas to, to love them as we're called to do. And, and, you know, and to have the courage to do that is so important as well. And you exhibit that nicely in your, your case examples here. Mm -hmm. there questions from others, please? Comments?
Yes, hello. Uh, doctor, very good presentation. Thank you. I would, like, I would like to ask you something, you know, in the uh, world, the secular world, mm -hmm. young women, all women, they believe, they're told to believe that uh, abortion and other reproductive rights are a symbol of freedom, but in reality, they enslave us. Exactly. Maybe you could tell something to the young women here among the medical students and other young people, what could they do to avoid this belief? Well, certainly uh, if you are Catholic, strengthen your faith. I mean, I would urge you to pray every day. God will guide you in what you should do. Have good friends, surround yourself with good friends. If you have friends that are not doing good things, you will fall into those same uh, bad habits uh, of doing. Uh, and read good books and watch good movies and just fill yourself with goodness uh, in everything that you do. But I will tell you, you sometimes may feel like you're alone, but there are many, many young people out there who are rejecting the culture, just as in Christ time, the Christians rejected the Roman culture. We can reject it and still find other wonderful, neat, exciting friends, um, but that are, are doing good things. And that's the important thing. And I use the word slavery too. I'm in a part of the country, probably half of my patients are African-American. And sometimes if the moment was right um, and people were talking about these relationships they couldn't get out of and all that type of thing, I, I would use the word slavery uh, because it is a form of sexual slavery. Women are being abused and used and, and men are being misled into being chronically teenagers and not ever growing up and being responsible and getting married and having children and all that, all those things, uh, tame men and kind of control our passions by getting married and having a family and, and being faithful to your wife and all those types of things. We, we live in a very difficult culture. I see in the audience actually Dr. Colasanti. Ricardo. Hello, hello. Yes, yes, yes. Do you want to say a few words? He's, uh, yes, Ricardo, so good to see you. Good to see you. I was really, was really moved by the, by Catherine, Dr. Catherine. Really, it was an incredible, an incredible speech. I was moved, to be, to be honest. No, if you want, uh, just a, a small comment, you know. Uh, we are, uh, fighting for the faith, you know, but like Mark Anthony said before, you know, we are sunk in a world where the culture of transgender, gender culture, homosexuality, it looks like that uh, raise a family, like it will be a sin for the left wing, a sin. I believe that we must fight, not only like Kathleen, it was great. Congratulations. You are another saint, Kathleen. After oh, Anna, ask my husband. <laughs> we will pray for the, your canonization. Don't, I, I start <laughs> to pray for you. Guys. Don't become, don't blush. blush. But we must start to work on an intellectual point of view, try to defend, uh, to defend not only our faith, but even the, 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 the the normal values, the normal values, you know, but to defend on an intellectual point of view against this movement that is very, very dangerous, uh, completely mad, crazy. We are in a crazy world right now. We must say, and in this in this field is very important. The university, university, we, not only we have to to defend the faith, but even to speak up. Speak loud, speak loud with intelligence. This is my uh, small comment. I remember I was, when you were speaking, no? I was remembering about uh, St. Paul, no? when he went to Athens and in Acropolis, he started to, to defend the idea of, the, of God against the philosopher of the dead age, you know? that at that age, the, the Greek philosopher are the, the most important in the world. No? Not everybody, recognize, but some of them change their mind. You know? We must do something like that. Something like mm -hmm. this is my small, but of course, Catherine, 
you are great. And thank you to Ines because it was really a moving. I'm working in hospital here in, in, in Ecuador and uh, it's difficult because it, our hospital is Catholic hospital. And we have a lot of problems. The, the real problem of the people is not uh, defending f uh, life, but it's the money. They cannot, they cannot pay, you know? It's another, mm, another no. problem. Anyway, I don't want to speak too much. Thank you, Kathleen, and thank you, Ines. Great. Thank, thank you, you, Ricardo. Dr. Ricardo Colasanti, very good to see you from Ecuador. Mm -hmm. And I hope yes. you know that uh, Professor De Vito can bring her students next time to Ecuador. Um, any other questions? Hmm? I don't think that we have any other questions. I'll just one. Uh, yes, Bob, please, please. Uh, Kathleen, uh, yes. two things. First of all, I, in my own experience as a lawyer, uh, leaving the profession many years ago and becoming more involved in things for the church, and especially we were involved in a lot of things that concerned families and youth. I saw from the practice, and it wasn't necessarily because I was the lead lawyer, but I was a, I was a lawyer that was sort of manipulating the whole background of things that went on in cases that most of the time, it came to the very end of the case when all hope would seem to be lost, that there was a complete turnaround that God seemed to, to, to mm -hmm. test us right to the very end. I mean, he could have won these things in the beginning. It could have changed in the beginning. <laughs> no, it had to go all the way through to the end before the turnaround came. And so I heard a little bit of that in what you were saying uh, before, that, you know, that we have an expectation that God's going to ride in at the beginning and mm -hmm. uh, we shouldn't give up hope because... He doesn't come sometimes until very at the very end when all hope seems to be gone. And it may be very quietly too. Yes. No, yes. Nothing dramatic, just very quietly. The other thing I was going to ask you is what do you think is the single most important thing that Catholics in general and university, Catholic university specifically, can do with regard to this whole culture of abortion and sterilization and gender and the rest. Where do we, you know, because the trouble with the Catholics is we've always relied upon the lay at the church to speak out for us. Mm -hmm. But today the culture is overwhelming. What do you think are, mm -hmm. is the single most important thing that we could do to counter this culture? Well, in the Catholic Medical Association, we have formed relationships over the past 10, 15 years where we band together. I mean, because we do have to do this as a united front. It's very hard for one person necessarily to fight the culture. But it's really just going back to St. John Paul II's Theology of the Body, which works through what it is to be a man, what it is to be a woman, what it is to be uh, a child. You know, we have to understand our basic, uh, uh, who we are as human persons. And I think once we understand that, then we'd say, well, you know, God made me a man. Why, why am I thinking I want to be a woman? Is it this culture that I'm in that's telling me this uh, or vice versa? Um, I, I think it's just understanding theology of the body and then having like-minded groups band together to fight laws, particularly that are coming out that are a violation of, uh, of human dignity. Um, but it's very difficult, but we should never give up. You know, God allowed us to be born during this time he wants us to be there fighting on the front lines against this culture that is basically paganism. It's denying everything that God has done. He made us male and female. He gave us the ability to have children. We need to be there fighting for God. Any other comments or questions? I would echo that, Kathy. Uh, very much so. It, it is fundamentally, and I say my students, fundamentally understanding who we are, who we are created, who we've been created uh, to be. Um, and I think one of the, uh, one of the dangers uh, is that we've forgotten. Uh, we talk, I talk a lot about a, a crisis of identity these days. Mm -hmm. We've forgotten 
who we are and to forget has lethal consequences as we're seeing. So, and I, the first forgetfulness actually is that we forget that we are children of God, you know, that it right. starts from there. That is, uh, that is the beginning, right? Yeah. So um, yeah. any other questions or comments from students? We have students here, any students? We have many students here. They've learned a little bit about the theology of the body and, uh, I hope hopefully that resonated with them. You just reinforced Kathy a, a lot of uh, right. things that we had talked about throughout the semester. Right. Well, thank you, right. uh, Ines, Ines. Yes, yes, Doctor Colasanti. Yes. No, for me the point is: in order to fight, we must focus on the concept of freedom, liberty, because the modern concept and on the concept of obedience, the authority, because. The modern concept of freedom, the absolute freedom of every individual being means that he can do everything. And we right. must focus this. We, it is impossible, impossible to match the absolute infinite freedom with society and with God. Impossible. We must, do a, we must start a, a, strong, uh, a strong reflection about that. Mm -hmm. Right, right, right. Any other comments? Anyway, thank you very much, Dr. Yeah. Raviele. We, we are very grateful for this wonderful uh, lecture. And I hope that we, you can come and visit us again. Mm -hmm. uh, I will invite Father uh, Colin now to say the, uh, the prayer, the concluding prayer. Father Colin. Thank you so much, Dr. Raviele. Thank you, Ines. Mm -hmm. um, I... The, uh, Saint Gianna prayed to submit to the to all the circumstances that the Lord brings into her life, brought into her life, and prayed also to know God's will. Um, God's will can be tricky sometimes. Um, we pray for. We remember all those in need tonight, all those in any need, those right around the corner down the hall, all those across the world. And we pray with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Father Colin. And thank you, everybody, for coming. Even we had, you know, Dr. Colasanti from Ecuador. What time is in Ecuador now, Dr. Colasanti? Uh, 7.13 p.m. Oh, okay. 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 And again, thank you very much, Dr. Raviel. God bless you for all the good that you do. We really want more doctors like you. And uh, thank you, um, Dr. Trevelin, for teaching this wonderful course, you know, to our students, just exposing the students to this, uh, uh, you know, uh, this view of uh, looking at medicine and he at healthcare in, in general. Thank you to our guests. Thank you, uh, Mr. Budelman, for always being here. And thank you for your support, actually, uh, and, uh, uh, and all your um, uh, donations mm -hmm. for, for this kind of event. Mm -hmm. OK? Thank you, students. I thank hope you. to see you in some other events, OK? Bye now. Thank you. Thanks, Kathy. Bye. Thank you, Ines. Thank you.